Grace and peace to you. Welcome to worship here at Trinity Presbyterian Church, wherever you are, whether you're watching us online or listening in on the radio. Today is World Communion Sunday. This is the Sunday that we remember that we don't come to the Lord's table by ourselves as individuals or even as a church family. We come as a worldwide community of believers, of people who've put their trust in Christ. And we want to encourage you to participate um, at home or wherever you are. If you just want to set a table there, uh, we can partake of the elements together later in the service. And now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship the living God. Our call to worship comes from Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims God's handiwork. The day pronounces God's glory without a sound. The night expounds God's knowledge without a word. And yet their voice goes out through all the earth. Let us join our voices with the voice of creation in declaring God's glory. Let us boldly confess our sin before the one who already knows our errors and is gracious to forgive our hidden faults. Let us pray. Your holiness, O God, commands that we confess. We have neither loved our neighbors as ourselves nor honored ourselves as your beloved creation. We have judged unjustly, regarded others ungenerously, profited at the loss of those near and distant, borne grudges, desired vengeance, and kept silence in the face of wrongdoing. We long to live in accord with your desire that your way of compassion, kindness, and honesty will govern our hearts and minds, turning us towards lives of peace. Forgive us and lead us. Amen. Righteousness does not come from our own doing or not doing. Righteousness comes from God by faith. It is through faithfulness of Christ our Lord that we are forgiven. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. How many plans that have you made lately that have been canceled? Maybe a birthday party was canceled. Many sports have been canceled. 
School has been canceled. Vacations have been canceled. Play dates have been canceled. I don't know about you, but the year 2020 feels like the year of cancellations. Jeremiah 29:11 says, For I know the plans I have made for you, declares the Lord, a plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God is saying, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. God will not leave you. Did you hear that? I know what I heard. I heard that all my plans could be canceled and all your plans could be canceled, but God's plans could never be canceled. In the next verse, God continues by saying, when you call on me, when you come to me and pray to me, I will listen. When you are looking for me, you will find me. So when all the cancellations feel like too much and you've been let down again, we know that we, we can go to God. We know that when we pray, He is there. He is listening. We know all along that we are in God's plan. After the worship video today, talk to your children about the canceled plans and how it made them feel. What did you do instead? How did God show up in those places? Make sure they know that God has got this. He knows what is happening and He is listening. Let us pray. God who speaks, your law is perfect, reviving the soul. Your commandment is clear, enlightening the eyes. May your spirit illumine this word that our eyes may be opened and our souls revived. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our first scripture reading for today comes from Psalm chapter 80, verses 7 through 15. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade the mighty cedars which it, with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it and all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
And our second reading comes from Genesis chapter 45 and beginning at verse 1. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord over all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, and you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks and your herds and all that you have, will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will come will not come to poverty and now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you you must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen hurry and bring my father down here then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept while Benjamin wept upon his neck and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them and after that, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today, we're coming to the end of a series through the life of Joseph. Last week, we learned that Joseph interprets a dream for Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is so impressed by Joseph's wisdom and ability that he puts him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. He's number two in the kingdom. Joseph is Pharaoh's right-hand man. Soon a famine comes and it spreads all over. It spreads outside of Egypt to the surrounding areas. And finally, it affects a family headed up by a man named Jacob and his sons. In other words, Joseph's dad and his brothers. Jacob hears that there is a place in Egypt where there's food, where grain can be purchased. And so he sends his son to go and get some. Jacob sends all but one, all but his youngest son, Benjamin. This is the son who, like Joseph, had been born to Jacob in his old age by his favorite wife, Rachel. This is the son that he cannot bear to lose. Jacob has already lost Joseph, and he cannot bear the thought of losing Benjamin too. All the sons except Benjamin go to Egypt, and this part of the story isn't in our text, but you can read about it in Genesis chapter 42 through 44. So they all go up before Joseph to beg for food. It's been over 20 years since they sold their brother into slavery, and they have no idea that this exalted man, this most powerful official in Egypt, is also their little brother. And so they bow down before Joseph. They lay their faces on the ground. You can remember that dream that Joseph had way back in chapter 37, where all of the brothers' stalks of grain bowed down before Joseph's. Well, it's coming true. The brothers don't know who Joseph is, but Joseph recognizes them immediately. However, Joseph doesn't tell them who he is. Instead, he accuses them of being spies. The brothers deny it. They say, we're just travelers from the land of Canaan. We're here to buy food. We're just a small family. We have one more brother at home and our dad, but that's 
all we are, we're of no threat to you. Joseph says, if that's true, uh, bring your little brother to me as proof. So bro Joseph's brothers go home. They tell their father Jacob what has happened. And at first, he won't let them return. He doesn't want to risk losing Benjamin. And finally, the famine is so bad and they're worried that they'll all starve to death. And so he sends them back with Benjamin this time. Now, at this point in the story, things get really strange. Joseph has a dinner for his brothers and he sends them home with lots of food and lots of money. But then he calls them back because he's missing a silver cup and they deny taking it. But when they're searched, the silver cup is found in Benjamin's sack. The silver cup is found there because that's where Joseph has hidden it. Joseph says, the rest of you are free to leave. You can go home to your father, have a good life. But the youngest one, Benjamin, must stay behind. Benjamin must pay for what he has done. And I've always wondered, why does Joseph do this? Why does Joseph orchestrate this little charade? Like, why doesn't he just lay all his cards on the table? After all, he's got the upper hand now. Those brothers will do anything he wants them to do. Why drag out the story like this? Why is Joseph keeping everyone in suspense? Well, there's something crucial going on here in this story. There is something essential to God's plan for reconciliation and redemption, and it is unfolding right before us. Here's what's going on. See, there are some people we don't expect to change, right? And Joseph didn't either. Joseph sets up this elaborate plot to test his brothers. He is hoping against hope that his brothers have changed, that they're different now, but he can't imagine it. But by giving them this choice, Joseph hopes to discover whether or not there has been any real heart change. Will they abandon Benjamin as they abandoned Joseph before? Or will they refuse to return home without their little brother? Here the brothers are one more time with their younger brother, the one whom their father loves, and they're faced with a decision. They can get rid of Benjamin like they did with Joseph, and this time they don't even have to do anything wrong. They don't have to kill him. They don't have to sell him into slavery. As far as they know, it's Benjamin's own fault. All they have to do is remain passive, and the favorite is gone once again. But Judah, one of the brothers, stands up, and what he says is utterly remarkable. It's the last thing that we expect Judah to say. He pleads, we cannot go back without Benjamin. It would kill our father. Let me take the place of my brother. He says, I know the law must be upheld. I know the debt must be paid. Let the punishment that he deserves fall on me. Now, this is Judah who's speaking here. This is the same Judah whose idea it was to betray Joseph and sell him into slavery and then to deceive their father. But now Judah shows himself to be noble, even heroic. And he offers his own life to keep the promise that they have made to their father. For the first time in the Bible, right here in this story, we see the possibility that one person would be willing to suffer and even die for another. One person would be willing to take on the punishment that belongs to someone else. Someone is willing to make amends for the wrong, to satisfy the demands of justice in order that harmony might be achieved so that the community might be made whole again. And after Judah speaks, Joseph knows that there has been genuine change. They are not the same men they were before. You see, God has done great work in Joseph, Joseph's heart. We've been watching that over the last three weeks. But now we see that God has been at work in the hearts of Joseph's brothers as well. And what that means is that now forgiveness is possible. The rabbis have this incredible saying about this passage. They would say, this is the day that forgiveness was invented in human history. 
Isn't that great? And now this strange charade comes to an end. Now the masks come off and there's this very tender moment and Joseph asks his attendants to leave the room. He is there alone with his brothers, this strong, resilient, powerful man who could not be broken by betrayal or enslavement or seduction or false accusation or imprisonment begins to weep. And he cries so hard that the Egyptians can hear him sobbing in the next room. And that's the power of a changed heart. That's the power of genuine, authentic transformation. And then Joseph says to his brothers in the passage that we read today, come close to me. Imagine that moment. And then Joseph reveals who he is. He says, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because God sent me before you to preserve life. And then Joseph throws his arms around Benjamin and Benjamin embraces him back and Joseph kisses all of his brothers. They weep together. Did you know that Joseph weeps more than anyone else in the Bible? Joseph is the biggest crybaby in Scripture. Why? Because of the beauty of reconciliation. It's the beauty of a relationship that gets redeemed. There is just simply nothing like it. Yeah, I've really enjoyed studying each week the Joseph story in preparation for Sunday. There's so much richness in this text, so much here for us to learn. And now as we close, I want to take just a moment to reflect on these past four weeks in light of the New Testament and specifically in light of the person of Jesus. When the early church read the story of Joseph, they said this story pointed to an even greater story that was to come. You see, God was preparing the world for a time when another father would send his beloved son to his brothers. And then this son too would undergo great suffering and be rejected. And then one day that son would be given a robe as well. But instead of being a sign of his status, that robe would be used to mock him. And he too would be betrayed and abandoned. He too would be sold for a few pieces of silver. But then like Joseph, from his suffering would come deliverance and salvation. But not just for one family, not just in one time and in one place. This deliverance would come for the whole world. This beloved son, whom we know as Jesus the Christ, brought an ultimate salvation, an ultimate restoration for everybody, everywhere. I don't know what you're going through right now. There is so much pain in our world and in our community and in our own individual lives. And maybe your suffering is the result of poor choices you've made. Or maybe it's suffering that's unrelated to anything that you've done. It doesn't really matter. Today, if your heart is broken, if you're scared, if you're disappointed with life, if you're thinking, can I ever get through this? If you're wondering, where is God? The answer is, God is right here. And you can know this God because he's revealed in the person of Jesus. Did you know that Jesus came from the line of Judah? Not Joseph, not Benjamin, but Judah. How appropriate. Remember, Judah was the one who said, I'll take the blame. I'll pay the price. Let the punishment fall on me. And that's what Jesus says too. I'll drink the cup. I'll carry the cross. I'll give my life. The Apostle Paul says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And this, friends, is the message of the gospel. Through Jesus, we can be made right with God, forgiven, accepted, and loved in spite of who we are, in spite of our sin and brokenness. One last thing. 
I cannot say, God, I want to accept your gift of reconciliation and acceptance for me, but I don't want to seek reconciliation with somebody else. I'll take it from you, but I won't give it to them. You see, the way of envy and resentment and bitterness was tried, and it always leads to death. So today, where is God calling you to reconcile or at least seek reconciliation? Maybe it's a brother or a sister or a mom or a dad or a son or a daughter or your ex or someone at work or at school. And I want to ask if you'll make that commitment to do whatever it is that you need to do. Make the call, write the note, go and visit. Will you pursue reconciliation in light of what God in Jesus has done for you? Friends, the story of Jesus points us to the person of Christ. In Christ, we have been reconciled to God and reconciled to one another. Let us pray. Lord, I pray for everybody here who knows what it feels like to be hurt or wounded or betrayed or rejected. I pray you would give wisdom and courage and determination of spirit and softness of heart. Thank you that you are with us on this journey and that you are working all things for good. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And now let us affirm what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so I said earlier that this is World Communion Sunday, and it's on this Sunday that we affirm with Christians everywhere the most basic but profound truth of our faith that we are saved by grace through faith and not of our own merit. It is the grace of God that brought Jesus into our world, that he came to live among us and to die for us and to be raised again. And then it is the faith that we have in the atoning work of Jesus Christ that is the hope that we have as believers. This is what we celebrate as we come to this table. Let us pray. God, we come to your table and we consider your love for all people. Draw us to comprehend the magnitude and variety of those who confess Christ as Lord and to consider all your children as brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray that you will keep us all in communion with the faithful from every time and place 
until we rejoice together in your eternal realm. Almighty God, we pray for your blessing on your church universal. May the faithful find salvation and the careless be awakened and the anxious be encouraged. May the tempted find help, the doubting find faith, and the so sorrowful find comfort. May the weary find rest and the strong be renewed. Eternal and ever-living God, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it is right to bless you, to give thanks to you, to worship you. Merciful God, you have called us into the fellowship of your Son. Draw us closer to you in this time of meditation and communion. May our hearts be open and our minds ready to receive your sacred truth. Enlarge our vision, deepen our loyalty, increase our faith, enrich us anew that with your divine love we might be faithful in all things. And hear now your people as we humbly pray, as Savior Christ has taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now the words of the institution of the Holy Supper. The Apostle Paul writes that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, also, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant shed for you in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have truly made us one with all of your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. And so we give ourselves to you that our daily living might bring glory and honor to your name. And now by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to the world until Christ comes in final victory. And we feast at his heavenly banquet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, being a part of something larger than ourselves gives life meaning and connects us with God in significant ways. And so let us offer our gifts today and this week, the gifts of our finances and our lives as we serve others and meet needs both near and far. So we have saved the most important verse in the Joseph story for last. At the very end, when Joseph appears before his brothers, he says words that have inspired and encouraged people of faith for centuries. He says, what you intended for harm, God intended for good. Friends, God is not the author of evil. God can do no wrong. But God can take even your greatest hardship, even your most difficult experiences, even your greatest challenges, and turn them for good. That's the promise of the gospel. God can redeem anything. And now as this service ends, go with God's blessing. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and forever. Amen.